The text this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the first six verses. These are the words of God. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written, on, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, forasmuch as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your kindness to us, gathering us together like this, giving us your word, giving us, giving us the sacraments. We are very grateful for our salvation and for the gospel. I pray that your spirit would be active and at work in our midst today, giving us a deeper and better and richer understanding of that gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're coming now to a passage that teaches us where the spiritual action really is. Do you want to be right with God? Now, oftentimes, if you ask people that, if they gave an honest answer, the answer would be, well, no, not actually, because to be right with God would mean giving certain things up. But many people desperately want to be right with God, and they're not sure how to go about it. What, and the fact that they want to be right with God means that God's already at work. And so what is the scriptural answer to that question? How can I be right with God? Now, getting right with God is not going to happen because you got all your papers in order and then got them stamped. This is not an ecclesiastical processing issue. Right with God is a judicial category. It is a judicial category. That's what justification is. It's God's declaration in a legal sense that you are not guilty. That is a judicial category. But having, it be, having justification be a judicial category is not the same thing as having it be a bureaucratic category or an ecclesiastical bureaucratic category. We don't process this sort of thing. It, we, what we do is we are to be responsive and obedient to the movement of the Spirit in our midst, and the Bible tells us how we're to go about that. So we are to learn two things. We must learn two things. First, the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. First, we have to learn that the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. But secondly, and this is just as important, we have to understand that the Spirit gives life to the letter. The Spirit gives life to the letter. We're going to go into that in greater depth in a little bit. This is why we have to have two things. We have to have the new covenant, and we must have a new heart. We have to have the new covenant, and we have to have a new heart. If we have the vocabulary of the new covenant uh, only, and we don't have a new heart, then what we've got is not the new covenant at all. The new covenant is a new covenant that traffics with human hearts. It deals with human hearts. So you, you can have the vocabulary of the new covenant and not have the new covenant. So we need to have the new covenant. We need to have a new heart. These two things go together. And when they go together, remarkable things happen. So let's consider a summary of the text. Paul asks the Corinthians here, he's come to the point in the letter where he asks the Corinthians, are you really going to make me talk about myself again, again now? Are you really going to make me address things that you already know? You already know these things. Are you going to make me say what you already know? Verse 1, do the Corinthians think that Paul needs a letter of recommendation, like some people Paul could mention? Right, the, he, has in, he has in view there the false, the false apostles that are going to come up later in the book. Those guys could sure use the letter of recommendation, but I don't need one because you guys are my letter of recommendation. What are they talking about? Paul says that they, the Corinthians, are his walking, living, breathing letter of recommendation. Verse 2, written on the hearts of the apostolic company. They, if, if Paul says, if someone demanded a letter of recommendation and I needed to come up, with, come up with one, I would appeal to you Corinthians. You know. You know my ministry among you. You know how I dealt with 
uh, how I dealt with you. You know what the Spirit of God did in our midst when I was ministering among you. You were there. I was there. We all know about it. Why are you asking for some uh, bureaucratic processing, some recommendation from some authority outside? You know. You already know. So the tablets were human hearts. But the manner of writing, this is quite striking, the manner of writing was not ink on papyrus, it was not a chisel for stone, but rather it was the, the writing utensil was the Spirit of God himself. The Spirit of God was the writing utensil, verse 3, and the Corinthians themselves were the letters that were inscribed. So Paul says, my heart, the hearts of the company with me, our hearts were the tablets, the Holy Spirit was the writing instrument, and you Corinthians were the letters that were engraven on our hearts. Paul then goes on to state his confidence in verse 4, which is toward God in Christ, toward God because of Christ. The same Paul, this is very remarkable and noteworthy, the same Paul who just a few sentences before had cried out, who is sufficient? You remember that? Who is sufficient for these things? And the, that's a rhetorical question, the answer to which is no one. No one is sufficient for these things. I'm not sufficient, you're not sufficient, nobody's sufficient. Who's sufficient? Nobody is. Now says our sufficiency is in Christ. So he now says, he, he grants, I'm not sufficient in myself, but nevertheless, I'm sufficient through God. That's verse 5. My sufficiency does not rest in me. God is the one who decided to make him a minister of the new covenant, and he was on a persecution mission when God acted, when God said, there, <laughs> he's not exactly going forward, but he's going somewhere. All right? he's, not re he's not repenting, but I'm going to call him to repentance. And God appeared to him, the Lord appeared to him on the Damascus road and gave him his apostolic commission. God made him a minister of the new covenant, and that new covenant is not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter kills, and this is a famous statement that is easily taken out of context. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Verse 6. Now, I'm going to return to this um, a few times in this message, but I want you to notice on your outline where it says the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life, that's made up of letters. That's, there's letters there. The letters tell you that the letter kills. So... That's not necessarily the letters killing, right? That, something else is going on. There are, people, there, there are some people who like to pretend that the things that they are doing are somehow exempted from the claims they are making, right? So uh, you'll run into Christians who say, no creed, but, no creed but Christ, no law but love. No creed but Christ, no law but love. That's, that's a nice creed. Very nice creed. Who, who form, what council formulated that creed for you? What, now, the, the, Paul is saying in a letter written with letters that the letter kills. But he's not talking about letters per se. He's not talking, letters, but talking about letters in themselves. Something else is going on, and we will get into that in just a moment. Let's talk about Gandalf and the Balrog. Not, we're not going to talk about Gandalf and the Balrog very much, but I hope you understand the application. Gandalf is the strongest character in Middle Earth, and Tolkien brings him right up to the limit in his encounter with the Balrog. This is a profoundly Christian insight. All right? Gandalf was a powerful wizard, powerful figure, powerful character, and Tolkien has him meet someone who almost undoes him. Every finite ser servant of God, every finite servant of God has a breaking point. This is what it means to be finite. If you're finite, then there could be a strength greater than yours. If you are finite, there can be a power greater than yours. If you are finite, there can, you can collide with an authority that overwhelms your authority. This is what it means to be finite. And because God tests his servants... He needs, he needs to take them right up to that limit. Even the greatest have to be taken up to that limit. And I would say especially the greatest have to be taken right up to that limit. Well, why? Why does God do this? Well, we saw, remember you saw in the first chapter, 
in verse 9 of chapter 1, Paul says this, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. We should, God, God brought us up to this point of death so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. And I said, especially those who are particularly talented, especially those who are brilliant, especially those who are gifted. Why? Who's, who's going to be the most likely to trust in his own ability? Well, someone who has some, right? Who's, who's most likely to trust in his own intelligence? Someone who has some. Who's, who's, uh, who has the greatest temptation to trust in his intelligence? Someone who has a lot of intelligence. So what God does is he, give, he gifts his servants. He gives, he, he gives great gifts to his servants, but then he takes them right up to the edge of that limit. Why? Because he doesn't want them to trust in themselves, but in God who raises the dead. I said a few times already in this series that the Apostle Paul was one of the most afflicted men who ever lived. All right, he, went, he, he was dragged through it. The, the Apostle Paul was one of the most afflicted men who ever lived. But we also have to recognize that he was one of the most gifted men who ever lived. He was one of the most gifted men who ever lived. He was brilliant. He was dedicated. He was hardworking. He, he had everything. He had it all in one package, and God says, you know what? I'm going to take that right up to the edge. I'm going to take that right up to the edge because that's the kind of person who trusts in himself. The greatest in ability will be the most prone to trust in themselves, and God wants to squeeze, and that's the right verb to use, squeeze. God wants to squeeze all the self-sufficiency out of his servants. God intends to squeeze all the self-sufficiency out of his servants. He does it with the Apostle Paul, and he's doing it with us. You, my son, are still entirely too perky. We need to steady you up a bit. We need to give you some burdens. We need to give you an affliction. We need to give you some trials. Why, Lord? Why, Why, Lord? I was minding my own business. Day was going great. Everything was wonderful. I had no problems. It was 10 a.m. and I had no problems and the sun was shining. I could have rejoiced in you all day. Yes, could have rejoiced in, you, in, in the Lord all day, but have been no use to the Lord all day. All right, God wants to use servants who are not trusting in themselves. Some men are too talented to use, at least in their current condition, but absolutely no one is too weak to use. You can be too talented to, to use. You can be too intelligent to use. You can be too hardworking to use. The Ephesians hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They were a hardworking church, but they had departed from their first love. So what God does is he takes us up to the limit so that we could stop trusting in self, stop trusting in that ugly monkey idol me. So God uses weak instruments. When, you're, when you are exhausted and virtually tapped out, this is the moment for God to move. When you don't have any more, this is when God steps in. When you don't have anything, anything left and you say, Lord, <laughs> that, all right, now, now, now it's time. Did Jeremiah feel sufficient? Jeremiah 1. Did Moses feel sufficient? Exodus 4. Did Ezekiel feel sufficient? Ezekiel 1. Did Gideon feel sufficient? Judges 6. Did Isaiah feel sufficient? Isaiah 6. Did Paul feel sufficient? Verse 16. Who is sufficient for these things? Absolutely no one. I want you to notice that I ran through a, a, a list of Bible heroes, great, great men of the faith, who couldn't do it. That's the whole point. We can't do it. And God uses gifted men. He uses weak men. He uses gifted men. But the gifted, the gifted men, the brilliant men, the hardworking men, the, the men who have it all together, have to feel like Gandalf with the Balrog. That's where it is. That's where God wants to take you. That's, where God, that's God's sweet spot. That's the Holy Spirit's moment to work. Who is sufficient for these things? And the answer is Christ is sufficient for these things. So, by the same token, 
And for this very same reason, we see that Paul had supreme confidence in his sufficiency in Christ. He says, our sufficiency is of God, verse 5. In other words, when you come to the end of yourself, you have not come to the end of Christ. Coming to the end of Christ's reserves is not even a possibility. Coming to the end of Christ doesn't happen. You can come to the end of yourself. You ought to come to the end of yourself. But you can't come to the end of Christ. And this, whatever the moment is, this is Christ's moment. Look to him. Say, Lord, I, I, yeah. I tell you what, why don't I look to you right now? And we don't have to go through all that. Well, yeah, I know how sneaky you are. No, God's going to take you right up to that limit because he's going to squeeze it out of you. We, can, we, we know how to say the right words. Lord, I don't, I'm not relying on myself. Lord, I give it all to you. Lord, I didn't. No, God wants to take you to the point where we all know self-sufficiency is gone. Now, there's, I want to bring, assemble a few pieces together, and uh, we come to this next section, which is called the finger of God. What, what do I mean, the finger of God? Paul says here that the letter he's talking about was inscribed by the Holy Spirit himself. He's talking about the letter of recommendation that was the Corinthians inscribed on his heart. That was inscribed by the Holy Spirit himself. We see elsewhere in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is equated with the finger of God. The finger of God is a name that Scripture uses for the Spirit of God. We can, we, um, we can see this by putting two verses side by side, uh, one passage in Luke 11:20 and the other in Matthew 12:28. Parallel passages, but there's a difference. In Luke it says, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus says, if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Then in Matthew, he says, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. The finger of God is the Spirit of God. The finger of God is the Spirit of God. But who inscribed the Ten Commandments on the tables of stone? Paul refers to the tablets of stone in this passage. But who inscribed the Ten Commandments there on the tablets of stone? And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Exodus 31, Deuteronomy 9, 10. So God is involved in all of it. The Spirit of God gives us his word, and whenever it's his word, the Spirit is the one who does it. The Spirit writes on tables of stone. The Spirit ins inspires Paul, and he writes on papyrus with ink. The Spirit inspires uh, the, the, the platform that delivers the word of God can vary. It can, it can be ones and zeros. It can be paper and ink. It can be papyrus and ink. It can be cuneiform. Uh, um, indentations in cuneiform. It can be tablets of stone. It's all true. Okay? It's all true. And when it's true, when it's the truth of God, the Spirit of God did it. The Spirit of God is the one who formed the letters, whether it's on tablets of stone wherever, or anywhere. He's the one who inscribes his word. And this is the key. Whether the words are inscribed outside the sinner or inside the saint. The words of God are inscribed either outside the sinner, which is what makes him a sinner, or inside the saint, which is what makes him a saint. If the word of God is out there, you're in your sins. If the word of God is in here, then you are forgiven for your sins. So this, is, this brings us to the solution to the apparent problem of the phrase, the letter kills. The problem with the letters that kill is not the fact that they are letters. It's not that they're letters. The killing impact of it has nothing to do with the fact that it's formed of letters. The letters written, the letters written in our hearts are letters. This epistle of 2 Corinthians was written with letters. So when Paul says the letter kills, he's not saying the letter kills, so therefore you should wad up 2 Corinthians and throw it away. He's not saying the letter... He's not saying that it kills simply by virtue of the fact that it's a letter. The problem with these letters that kill is not who wrote them. The Spirit is the one who wrote them all. The Spirit is the one who wrote them on the tablets of stone, and the Spirit is the one who wrote the Corinthians onto the apostolic hearts. 
The difficulty is where the letters are written, not the fact that they're letters. So when Paul is compared, when, when Paul says the letter kills, the spirit gives life, he is talking about letters outside and letters inside. It's not letters versus no letters. It's letters out there and letters in here. So when they are written on stone, external to the sinner, out there they do nothing but condemn. And the truer they are, the more condemnation they bring. The more truth that's out there, the more condemned I am. When the law is out there, the law is my adversary. When the gospel is out there, the gospel is my adversary. Nothing from God out there is my friend. I must, in order to be friends with God, all of what he offers has to be inside, has to be taken in. When the gospel is out there, the gospel is my adversary. When the law is out there, the law is my adversary. When the truth of God is simply out there, in a leather-bound Bible, on your shelf, then your heart is still as black as the leather. Your heart is as black as this, if it's out there. If the Bible's on your shelf, it hasn't touched anything. So the thing that determines what happens in this whole area is the regenerate or unregenerate state of every human heart. And it's one or the other. Every human heart is either regenerate or unregenerate. Every human heart ha is either at enmity with God or by God's grace has been softened and is made open to God. But it's gotta be one or the other. There is no third condition. Every human heart is either unregenerate or regenerate. The unregenerate, the unregenerate heart is wrecked by everything divine. The law condemns him, Galatians 3.11, and the gospel, the gospel, the good news, is the aroma of death to him, 2 Corinthians 2. Now, the Ark of the Covenant had what on top? It was, had the mercy seat on top, right? And Uzzah died because he touched it. We don't know if he touched the mercy seat, but he steadied the Ark, and he died. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, the cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not the blood of Christ? But why, why were people sick at Corinth? And why had some died at Corinth? Because of, they, because of how they were interacting with the cup of blessing, right? So objectively, the gospel out there is gospel. Objectively, the cup of blessing out there is the cup of blessing. But if I'm unregenerate and rebellious, if I haven't taken it all in by faith, if, if it's not in here, then then it's my adversary, whether it's gospel or law, whether it's sacramental or propositional. Everything divine is hostile to me if I am hostile to God. So the, the regenerate heart is nourished by everything. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, Psalm 19.7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The gospel is the aroma of life to those who are being saved. So if you're, if you're Talking about a regenerate heart, everything that comes from God is good news. Everything that comes from God is good news. If you're dealing with an unregenerate heart, if it's from God, then that natural antipathy toward God rises up. The unregenerate man always wants his religion out there where he can manipulate it, defend it, control it, ideally make money off it, argue about it, or even orchestrate riots on its behalf. That might be an odd thing to say, but I, I noticed recently go, uh, reading through Acts that there's a juxtaposition of two riots in uh, Ephesus and in Jerusalem. The unregenerate heart came up with a riot at Ephesus, greatest Diana of the Ephesians, Acts 19.28, Acts 19.34, and the unregenerate heart did the same exact thing for the temple of Jehovah in Jerusalem, in Acts 21, 29. So the people in Ephesus were yelling, great is Diana of the Ephesians for a couple of hours. But some of them weren't, didn't know why they were there and didn't know why they were yelling that, but they were, the, they were enthusiastic participants. And they were yelling, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Then you go, you fast forward over to Jerusalem and you've got Jews, faithful servants of the true God, carrying on in exactly the same way, throwing dust in the air and... and what? What's going on? Incidentally, the name of the real God 
And it's one God. The name of the real God in both of these two instances was Mammon, a substantial God that a man can manage and handle. Um, the idol trade in Ephesus was threatened by Paul's preaching, and the preaching of the gospel in Jerusalem did the same thing. Uh, the temp that temple apparatus, which was a major moneymaker, was being challenged by the gospel. The Most High does not live in temples made with human hands. So Mammon was upset. Mammon was angry in both cities, and Mammon behaved the same way in both cities, and Mammon summoned unregenerate servants in both cities, and they acted the same way. And int interestingly, the riot in Jerusalem was set off because the Jews there had jumped to the conclusion they had seen Trophimus the Ephesian with Paul in the city, and they had assumed that Paul had taken Trophimus the Ephesian into the temple. And so they decided, we need to riot here in Jerusalem to make Trophimus feel at home. You know, we have religious riots in Ephesus. Why they do the same? Why they do the same thing here in Jerusalem? We have religious riots everywhere. So the life and death issue, the life and death issue, the eternal issue, everything hinges on this. It's not the presence of truth or the fact that truth is communicated by means of letters. Rather, it's the presence of truth in the inner man. That's the issue. The presence of truth in the inner man. The letter out there kills. Old covenant letters out there kill. New covenant letters out there kill. The truer it is, the, the, deader it, the deader it slays me. So it's got to be the presence of truth in the inner man. As the old evangelical saying goes, too many miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between here and here. They miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between the head and the heart. Psalm 51, verse 6 says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. This is where you learn. You don't learn anywhere else. You can, you can learn all kinds of things externally, and you can parrot them back, but it's all superficial. It's truth bouncing off of you. It's truth bouncing off of you and back to the one who's teaching you your lessons, back to the one who's catechizing you. What you want to do is you don't want to be a little bronze um, metallic surface that has truth bounce off of. You want to be a sponge. And you want to take the truth in and soak it up. Keeping the true religion out there, and, and the truer it is, the worse this gets, keeping the true religion out there is the way to turn it into a false religion. If it's true, the truer it is, the worse I am. All right? if, you, if you have the scriptures and you have the ancient ecumenical councils and you have the Westminster Confession of Faith and the original Greek, you have everything, everything stacked all up. If it's out there, you're turning into a devil. You, I can affirm it all. I can affirm it all out there. The more truth you affirm that's external to you, the worse it is. So the external letter kills, but the spirit brings life. But one of the things the Spirit does is he brings life to the letter. He does this by inscribing his letters on the human heart. The heart is the only place where the letters written by the Spirit on stone or papyrus or wax or printed paper or ones and zeros, the human heart is the only place where those letters can come to life. They come to life in relationship. They come to life between in the relationship between Christ and the Christian between God's people and God himself. There are two fundamental features of the new covenant. And the co th this new covenant is occupying a central place in Paul's thinking and Paul's argument here. Jeremiah's promise of the new covenant is quoted in Hebrews in two places, Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10. So the, the great new covenant promise is quoted in Hebrews 8 in full, and then a couple chapters later, he quotes it again. But this time, the second time he quotes it, it's with just a couple of pull quotes. So he has the whole thing, Jeremiah's whole prophecy about the new covenant in Hebrews 8. And then a couple of pull quotes two chapters later. And he's, he's quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. The first time is Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. But then when he gets to chapter 10, 10 verse 17... We learn, we learn one feature of the new covenant, which is the new covenant brings forgiveness of sin. The new covenant brings forgiveness of sin with it. 
Hebrews 10, 17. That's one fundamental feature of the new covenant. Your sins are forgiven through Christ, and thanks be to God. But the second thing is this. The new covenant brings about an internalization of the law. That's Hebrews 10, 16. That's the second thing he pulls out of that of Jeremiah's prophecy. And that's what we're talking about here. The internalization of the law is what we're what, what Paul's urging, what Paul's arguing, what, what Paul is pleading with the Corinthians to see. But look, when God writes his law, when God writes his law on our hearts, something remarkable happens. Not only is thou shalt love thy brother written on your heart, your brother himself is also written on your heart. God does not just write the proposition, or the, rather the, the imperative, you, you need to love your brother. Love your brother. That's written on your heart. But even non-Christians can have that level of awareness. Even non-Christians know that you're supposed to love other people. All right, that's something you can cognitively know that. God inscribes the command, love your brother, love your sister, love your wife, love your husband. All, the command to love others, love your brothers and sisters, that proposition is inscribed in our hearts, but more than that, your brother himself is written there. Your sister herself is written there. Remember that Paul begins this whole section by saying that the Corinthians were written on his heart. The Corinthians were written there. Love your neighbor is condemnation when it's engraved in stone or on a plaque or in a devotional or stuck on the fridge. It might even be a book of inspirational quotes. It might even be an inspirational coffee cup. Love your neighbor. Love the person in front of you. If it's out there, if all you do is drink coffee out of it, it's condemnation. But when God brings it home to you, he does not just engrave a proposition about your neighbor on your heart, but he engraves your neighbor on your heart. That's what he does. And this can only happen because Christ was engraved there first. When Christ is brought in, Everything else, everything he has, everything he possesses, everything that Christ owns is brought in as well. So when the law is internalized, this brings the sinner to life. And when the law is internalized, it brings the letters to life. Everything is brought to life. What happened to the handwriting of ordinances that was against us? I'm using the language of Colossians 2.14. Gathered, God gathered up the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. He gathered them all up, and he nailed them to the cross. Now, some people, thinking simplistically, think, well, that does away with the law then. That does away with moral order. That does away with righteousness because God nailed all of that to the cross. Yes, but Jesus was nailed to the cross also, and he's still with us. How is he still with us? Well, he came back from the dead. What happened to the law that was nailed to the cross? It came back from the dead. It's alive and in your heart. That's what, ha that's what this is doing. That's what God is doing. This is, this is remarkable. This is not, should we be legalists or antinomians? That, that's a not, for, for Paul, this is just a nonsensical question. The law is alive and in you. The law is alive and in you because Jesus is that law. Jesus, the, Jesus is the end of the law, the point of the law. It's all in Christ. So what happens to anything that's nailed to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? One exception, which I'll get to in a second. There's one exception. Everything nailed to the cross with Christ is raised from the dead. The one exception, the one thing that doesn't rise from the dead is the sin itself. That's nailed to the cross, and that never comes back. So Jesus is nailed to the cross the sin is nailed to the cross. The law is nailed to the cross. Everything that's nailed to the cross comes back from the dead except for your sin. Except for the worst thing you ever did. That is gone. That is as far away from you now as the east is from the west. The worst thing you ever did as far as the east is from the west. The worst thing you ever did is at the bottom of the sea. So, sin doesn't come back. But accusations of the law, gone. How about the condemnation? Gone. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The condemnation is gone. How about the black despair of never being good enough? 
never being good enough, and the black despair, I will never be a good enough Christian. Gone. Dead. And that's gone. The accusations, gone. But what comes back is righteousness, moral order. Up is still up, down is still down. Light is still light, dark is still dark. But it's alive now. The light, the light is living. You can taste it, you can feel it. Because it's all embodied in a person who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So all that negative gunk, all the gunk, all the accusation, all the self-righteousness, all the striving, all the despair, all the guilt, all of that is gone, dead and gone, Six, dead and deep. All of it is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. That's what it means to be a Christian. Your, your sins are forgiven. And the law is internalized. That's what it means to be part of the new covenant. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are cleansed. Your sins are washed away. And God has written his way on your heart. And it's alive there. The law, that law that used to condemn you, is raised again with you. And is now your liberty. It's now your refreshment. It is now your pleasant instructor. His name is Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the gospel that you've given us. We thank you for all these things in the name of Jesus. And he's the one who taught us to pray, saying, It indeed will be a glorious day when we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. That day is coming. He will return bodily, and you will lay eyes on him. In the interim, we are often tempted to think that the Lord Jesus is far away. The enemy would have us think that we are alone. Our Savior knew this, and so he said before his ascension, Lo, I am with you always. It follows that the Lord Jesus is with us right now. He is near us. He is born of the virgin, and he is here. So when Christ says to eat and drink in remembrance of him, it does not follow that we eat and drink while remembering him like we remember a dead relative. Jesus is not dead. When we remember Christ at this supper, we remember that he is God with us. He is not merely the God who was with us. He is God with us. Okay, you say, if he is with us, then where is he? Well, he is in you. Paul says this very thing in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. This is the hope of glory, Christ in you. Now you may ask, do you mean that the idea of Christ is in me? Certainly you must mean that the Christ idea is in me. No, that's not it. The real Christ is in you. The Spirit of Christ is in you. And you come now to spiritually feed upon Christ. You come to eat bread and drink wine. This bread and wine will enter you. And so Christ himself has entered you. You all are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So how could you ever be afraid? How could you ever think you're alone? Alone, Christ is in you. Alone, you are in Christ. Alone, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. The charge is this. You may have concluded that during the course of the sermon that I was talking about uh, the evangelical doctrine of the new birth, which is exactly what I was talking about. But here's the, the caution. Here's the warning. I wasn't talking about the cliche, you must be born again. And I wasn't talking about true statements that you may have read on a billboard, you must be born again, or re read on a bumper sticker. The problem with the bumper sticker and the problem with the billboard is that it's out there. That's the problem. So what I'm talking about is tasting what we're talking about, experiencing what we're talking about, living it, and having it inside. So with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.